Why is it that almost every mouthful of meat that we eat comes from just five different animals? Great question. So at manufacturing, we basically just make a shitload of cells. For what? Uh, to make... <laughs> <laughs> I had one job. Bao is an amazing cultured meat company. We are a whole bunch of amazing talented people that come together to solve this sustainable problem. You take the cells that are normally found in meat and grow them up in an environment outside of the animal. So you end up with something which is very, very close in biology, but grown inside large stainless steel tanks using electricity. So it has a much smaller physical footprint, takes up much less land and a much smaller environmental footprint. We use this technology to engineer entirely new types of food from the ground up that are tastier, more nutritious, and more functional than meat from animals. So it's our goal that in the future, you'll purchase meat based on brands, and you'll have familiarity with the experience of eating those brands and why you choose them, not based on the animals that they come from. Well, we have already built up the world's largest cell library. We have more than 15 different species and more than 400 cell lines um, in-house, and uh, our goal is to continue to expand that and characterize all of these different species and cell lines as, uh, across that cell library based on what they bring to different foods. It's very interesting. This is Val. They're based in Sydney. And like the previous company we looked at, Perlita Foods, where Nikita is looking to bring seafood to places who can't traditionally access it, and is talking about new exciting future of food. This next company with George is doing a very similar thing, except they're completely looking at how do we actually change the concept of meat itself. And at the end of this video, I'm going to start to go into a bit of the details on their Series A, which they raised. Huge congratulations to them. And I'm going to look at what I think the seed investors would have made as they brought the company into the Series A. But first, I want to play some clips of George speaking at a conference about six months ago because he has some really interesting things to say about how we should think about the future of food. All right, good morning. Um, my name's George. I have traveled here from Sydney, Australia to explain to you why self-cultured elephant is actually a really good idea. So let's get into it. Let's start with the very beginning. Why are we all in this room? And a really big reason for that is for one way or another, we look at this as something that we don't want to take with us to the future. Whether you care about the rights of animals, whether you're concerned about the climate that we live in, or whether you just care about the productivity of manufacturing, you look at this and you go, this sucks and we really don't want to do more of it. Cell Ag is obviously cool and interesting to you if you're here, because we can take the production of animal tissue into advanced uh, facilities near where people eat it, fueled with renewable power, which is great. So let's just start by stepping right back to the very first principles of cultured meat. Thinking about it in the simplest possible terms, cultured meat is taking in primitive ingredients like sugars, salts, amino acids, and growth factors, and using cells inside of this magical black box to turn those into biomass that we can consume. Run the whole thing on renewable energy and you get a really much more sustainable way of producing food. There's two really massively outsized levers in this process that drive the scalability, the economics, and the quality of food that we can produce. That's the cells that we use to make the food and where we source those cells from, and that's the product that we choose to come out the other side with. Let's go into each of those individually to look at what are the best things that we can be making from both the food that we can enjoy and the cost and the scale we can produce it at. So if we were starting with a blank sheet of paper, if we were going right back to the beginning with no preconceptions of what we wanted to make, what would be the best cells for cultured meat? They would, of course, grow really quickly. They would grow to really high densities. They'd grow in dirt cheap media, basically Powerade. They would last forever, and they would be really tasty, safe, and resistant to shear so you can scale them up. The best possible cells for cultured meat would do all of these things fabulously. So let's just like zoom in on one of them. Let's just, let's just look at the speed at which cells grow. If you look across a bunch of early primary cells isolated from different species, these are all muscle stem cells at low passage, and the rate at which they double, the main species we eat, things like chicken and beef, typically around 24 to 30 hours, straight out of, uh, sort of straight from initial tissue to digestion, 
Some other species, things like migratory birds like uh, the warbler, can be as low as eight or nine hours. So when it comes to just looking at one of these parameters, the species that we've domesticated are a really long way away from the front. And this is pretty much true in every one of these characteristics, whether it's shear resistance, whether it's density, whether it's the uh, cost of media. Beef, chicken, and pork put a really huge amount of additional constraints on making and scaling up cultured meat. And that brings us to cell cultured elephant. So quick question, who here thinks that cell cultured elephant would win on all of these dimensions? Put your hand up. I have some really exciting news about elephant cells. I am betting my entire career, my reputation, my investors' money, and the jobs of all 54 people on the VOW team, that elephant cells are going to be the best at all of those things. Every single one of them. Who here wants to place that bet with me? Wow, you two are nuts. <laughs> and it sounds kind of crazy, right? There's 10,000 animals on the planet. There's 10,000 species of mammals and birds on this planet today. What are the odds that elephants are going to be the best possible cells to grow in cell culture? It's basically zero. Of course, they're not going to be the best at everything. But that is the bet that almost every cultured meat company and researcher is placing by focusing their effort on some species that we've traditionally consumed. The odds of beef, chicken, or pork being anywhere near close to the front of the best possible things that we can be producing to scale cultured meat as quickly and as economically as possible is nearly zero. So let's look at the other side of this equation. Let's think about the meat that comes out the other side. So they might not be economical, but they're definitely the most delicious, right? Our ancestors went searching around the whole planet to find the tastiest possible animals to domesticate, right? Kind of. So around 10,000 years ago, our distant ancestors were chilling in their village, and a red guinea fowl and a wild boar kind of wandered in. And they were like, cool, these animals are pretty laid back. Don't get in our way. Rep like, reproduce easily. They're great. Let's just, keep, let's just let them hang around. And we've kind of held on to this tradition, because we've always had this legacy. And these animals are easy to industrialize and scale up. We've spent hundreds of years developing and refining their genetics to grow well in intensive ag animal agriculture environments. What do you think the tastiest animal on the planet would be, though, if we could go and search through? I wonder what the best would be. Luckily for us, someone's already done that. It's not me, yet. Give me a few more years. Charles Darwin. <laughs> Charles Darwin, as he sailed around the world on the HMS Beagle, had a hobby. And that hobby was catching, killing, and eating a huge variety of animals to see how they tasted. He meticulously documented this. He was a scientist after all. He described puma as tasting a lot like veal. He described tortoise as being exceptionally delicious, although its urine was a little bit bitter. <laughs> He had a university club called the Glutton Society, which did a similar thing. They disbanded after they ate a brown owl so disgusting they decided to stop doing the society. Who can guess what Charles Darwin thought was the tastiest animal on this earth? <laughs> I had elephant and kangaroo. Both are wonderful ideas, but totally wrong. It would be great if it was elephant, though. That would have been very thematic. No, the tastiest animal on this planet, according to famed naturalist Charles Darwin, is, of course, the agouti. <laughs> a 20-pound South American rodent found in the jungle. He ate everything he could get his hands on, and he said the agouti was by far the tastiest meat he had ever consumed. So, coming back to what we're doing in cultured meat, by sticking with just the major domesticated animals, we're not setting ourselves up to produce the cheapest possible uh, cell mass in scale. We're not setting ourselves up to make the tastiest possible meat that we could. So why are we choosing these animals? Of course, it's to meet customers where they are today. The big assumption that we're making as an early cultured meat industry and a group of cultured meat researchers is we can have impact by replacing one food with the same thing made in a different way. Over the last three and a half years, 
we've built out a cell library of around uh, 21 species across mammals, avians, reptiles, and marine species, specifically with the goal of understanding how they taste, how they cook, look, smell, and the economics of their growth, so that we can treat these as ingredients to make products that animals can't. This has a few really handy advantages. We don't have to restrict ourselves to the finicky biology of chicken, beef, or pork. We can just keep scanning until we find things that are easy and cost-effective to grow. We can create a product that animals can't, that is differentiated, solves a problem, and we can charge a premium for that as a result of it. Later this afternoon, we're going to hear about the techno-economic challenges of cultured meat. The huge assumption that's missed there is those, that case is only true if you don't change the other side of the equation of what people are buying. Cheerios cost a hell of a lot more than the commodity grains that go into them. In fact, General Mills that makes Cheerios have better margins than Netflix or Tesla. So just by creating differentiated and branded products, the economic challenges become substantially easier. And the best bit, and our entire secret as a company, is if you make something that's never existed before, no one has anything to compare it to, either in price or in sensory experience. So if I hand you a product that we've made, I tell you what you're about to taste, and it tastes like what I've said, you're going to be like, oh, that's great. It's like when you go to a wine tasting and they're like, oh, it's leathery and it's got a bouquet of raspberries, and you're like, oh, yes, it definitely does. That's lovely. <laughs> Whatever they tell you it tastes like, if you taste that, you're like, great, that's fantastic. And so by not replicating animals, it's actually a substantially easier, te uh, easier technical challenge, and we end up with products that are so different that we're able to market them in an entirely new way. This is the very first product that we're launching. We're launching this as soon as the end of this year in Singapore, and it's just called Morsel. It's not an animal. I don't really care about animals. I care about making the best possible food. You can see it cooking on a yakitori grill over some charcoal there. When you eat Morsel, you get this really big umami hit up front. It's really intense roasted meat flavors. And then it kind of melts in your mouth a little bit like a beef brisket or like a buttery prawn. And as you chew it, you get these really nice aromatic seafood notes that come out. It's just really, really tasty food, but there is no point of comparison for it. It is entirely new and a really wonderful experience. But I know what you're thinking. That's great and all, but why, like, how do we know people are actually going to eat this? How do we know this is actually going to create change? There's never been a new meat introduced in my lifetime. Except there has. There's been a bunch of new meats introduced over the last 50 years. Sashimi, or raw fish, was basically illegal in the US up until the 1990s. Rules changed. It got introduced to very, very high-end dining, you know, $50 a plate sushi places in LA and New York. And then the mid-range restaurants that look to the high-end restaurants for inspiration started to introduce it and serve it. And then the low-end restaurants that look to the medium-range restaurants, they started to do the same. So when I was a kid, I used to watch American TV, and the sort of punchline would be, if someone said anything about sushi, ugh, raw fish. A couple of years ago, when I walked into a Walgreens in San Francisco, they have a sushi section serving sashimi. So in around 25 years, sashimi went from illegal to so ubiquitous you could buy it in a Walgreens. The same is true of things like ribs in Australia and pork belly in the UK. Over the last few decades, parts of animals or ways of serving animals have went from, uh, gone from not being present in a market to being so ubiquitous they can be found in every supermarket. The same can and will be true for products like Morsel. They will become ubiquitous and abundant and we'll just get used to them because they're going to follow the pattern of every new meat and every new cut of meat that's been introduced over the last 50 years. Gives you something to think about, doesn't it? Now, let's get into the Series A news, which is super exciting. If you want the full, nerdy, unedited, detailed financial information, Patreon's where you can find that. There's a new video up tomorrow with all the details from PitchBook. But let's just go through some of it right now. Post from the CEO George announcing their Series A. So this was on November 14th. It happened just over a week ago from when this video was recorded. I'm going to read part of it because it's just super, super interesting. And I'm really liking this company. 
Vow is built on a really simple idea. Invent new meats that meat lovers choose selfishly, all while having the smallest possible impact on our planet. Today we announced an important step on this journey, sharing the news of Vow's 49.2 million Series A, led by Blackbird and Prosperity7 with participation from these other VC partners. This new funding enables us to bring our first products to market, as you just saw in the earlier clips, Build Out Factory 2, as you just saw in the earlier clips, to massively expand manufacturing and grow our commercial team. All of this sets Vow on the trajectory to become the biggest food company on the planet. The logic of Vow is extremely simple. To change the behavior of people that love eating meat, we need to make foods that are better than what already exists. We need to win over the meat eaters. Making foods for vegans and vegetarians will not change the demand for meat. To do this, we need to make food that is tastier, more nutritious, and more functional than animals. Meat so good that they are chosen selfishly. We believe the more than 1 trillion global meat category has already begun its transition from animals to brands. Today, we use animals and the cuts we eat as a shorthand for the flavor and nutrition of different meats. We know that chicken breast is lower in fat and lighter in flavor than a pork belly, or that salmon is a more nutritious option than bacon. We aren't selecting chicken specifically because you want to eat something that had feathers, nor salmon for something scaly. In fact, we try very hard to forget the animal when we eat meat. We believe as cultured meat technology advances, we will design meats to be sold without any reference to animals. After all, this is already how we buy most of our food. You can immediately imagine what Cheerios look like, taste, and sound like. The same with an Oreo or a Ritz cracker. Now, I hope the food that Val makes is going to be better than Cheerios and Oreos and Ritz cracker. But when you take a bite, you're almost certainly not thinking about the specific grains that are used in their production. We believe 50 years from now, you will buy meat in much the same way, buying branded meats that don't even reference animals. This is what we are building at Val, building both the technology and the products that will form this future category. We're a young company with an enormous ambition to build the largest food company on the planet. Almost three years ago to the day, we sent a letter to all our shareholders that included the summary of what we would do. We want to make it extremely clear that Vow is a food company enabled by cultured meat technology, not the other way around. Our long-term goal is to have a wide range of food products under different brands that appeal to their respective markets. To get there, we have to move the industry away from its prohibitively expensive medical technology origins. All right, so if you look at most of the companies today and you look at where the industry is, everyone's kind of trying to figure out how do we get away from this equipment, the bioreactors that are all designed for the healthcare industry, because that's where this technology really comes from. How do we apply it all to food? This first year will see us looking a lot like a biotech company. We need to focus close to 100% of our effort in hardcore R&D to get to a first iteration of food that can be grown at scale. This will require a great deal of time spent in the lab. The initial strategy of Vow is to enter the fine dining food market where chefs are adventurous enough to play and customers are prepared to pay a premium. This will almost certainly be outside of Australia at first. It will be in Singapore. In parallel to this, we will continue to pour the majority of our efforts into R&D, advancing towards entering premium retail and food service markets. These will be better products under individual brands at higher volumes. All cash flow will continue to be poured back into R&D to increase production capacity reduce per unit costs, and bring more and more branded products to market quickly. We can scale the best products and brands to power this virtuous cycle, ultimately becoming a house of brands with incredible food products. So in summary, number one, produce high-end food products sold to fine dining experiences. Number two, pilot early products in markets with accelerated regulation. 
Number three, scale the winners, continue to pilot more and more products. This was a strategy in 2019 and is still a strategy today. Three years ago when we shared this, we were a team of just four people. We were working out of a lab in high school. We had a lot to learn. Now, just as we planned, we have prepared our first product, Morsel. Here we can see the product. It will be launching in 2023 in high-end dining in Singapore. Morsel is made using cultured umai quail cells. So this is our first product. It will be launching in Singapore next year. Once I know where, I will update the map. Now to look briefly at the financials, we can see back when he wrote that blog post, George wrote that in 2019 when they did their first grant fundraising round. So this was for $175,000. Then two years later in 2021, they raised a seed round of just over 7 million. And we can see we have the cap table history and the number of shares. If you want to see all the details and go into the full analysis of this, I will have a video up tomorrow on Patreon for my supporters. Then they were part of an incubator. And finally, in 2022, just a week and a half ago, they finished their Series A, which raised almost $50 million. What I'm going to look at in the video is there were four initial investors in the seed round and I'll be showing you how much of the company they bought because this cap table is updated January 2021. We don't have the latest series A cap history yet of those shares but we can still do the math to see roughly what the VCs probably would have made between the seed round and the early stage so that's about 20 months and from what I can tell they at least doubled their money if not 3x'd it. So all the details and the deeper analysis of that, if you're a financial nerd, get onto Patreon and I'll have a video there tomorrow. This is a quick look at Vow. I think they're a super exciting company and they're one of the first that I've seen to actually look into the future and really think about how this technology could really impact how we actually eat meat, not just let's replace the existing five animals that we eat today because, you know, that's cool and all, but there's a lot more exciting things we can be doing. Thanks for watching.